Hey, hello everybody, this is Mr. Ainsworth. We're going to get into, uh, well, some people call it Unit 4 test. And I call it uh, basically Chapter 3 test here in Calculus here, although it's going to cover Section 2.6 on related rates. And not all of Chapter 3, actually. We're not going to cover optimization on this test, but we're going to cover mainly 3.1 three, three to 3.6 as well as uh, Section 6 on Related Rates in Chapter 2. All right, so let's go through some of the basics here. I've already reviewed a lot of the concepts in the last few days, but here are some additional questions here that you want to make sure you're able to do for the exam. Okay, we want to find the relative extrema uh, given the function here. Rel relative extrema on a function occur when f prime of x is equal to 0. You want to solve that equation there. So we want to differentiate and figure out where f prime is equal to zero and also figure out where f prime is um, non-differentiable, basically where it's undefined. Okay, so let's go ahead and use the quotient rule. Let's, let's differentiate here, f prime of x. Here we go. Uh, we're going to take uh, x squared plus four, got to have in parentheses there, quantity, times the derivative of the numerator, two x, minus derivative or excuse me, numerator times the derivative of the denominator, which is 2x, all divided by the denominator squared. All right, that's called the quotient rule. We're going to set that, well, first of all, we're going to simplify it. All right, 2x cubed uh, plus 8x minus 2x cubed divided by quantity x squared plus 4, quantity squared. Of course, these cancel out, and you get 8x divided by the quantity of x squared plus 4 quantity squared. Now, when is this equal to zero and where is it undefined? First of all, the denominator here is never equal to zero, so it's defined everywhere. So the only place we have to look is in the numerator. And a fraction is equal to zero when the numerator is equal to zero. So I've got to solve uh, 8x equal to zero, and that's not too hard, x is zero. So this is a critical point of the function. Here are the derivative and relative extrema. If they have one, occurs always at critical points. All right, so we need to do an analysis here on the first derivative. And see what's happening to the left and right of 0 to find the extreme and determine what it is, whether it's relative max or relative min. OK, I know the denominator is always positive because something squared is always positive. So really just check the sign of the numerator. So something left of 0 is like negative 1. So if prime of negative 1 is going to be 8 times negative 1 is negative divided by positive. That's negative, of course. That means the function is decreasing from negative infinity to zero. F prime of one, well that's different. Eight times one is positive, divided by positive equals positive. So it's positive there, it's increasing on uh, the interval from zero to infinity. So if the function is going down and then going back up, left and right at that critical point, then we gotta rel have a relative uh, minimum here. And a relative minimum at 0, comma, whatever f of 0 is. And f of 0 is going to be 0 plus 1, and that's just 1, so 0, comma, 1. So the answer to our question is right here. 0, comma, 1 is a relative minim minimum, no max. Okay, next one here. Find the critical points once more. Find critical points by setting the first derivative equal to 0, if that exists. So we want to differentiate, and this time using the product rule, and actually the chain rule. It's a chain rule within a product rule. So f prime here is going to be equal to 5x times the derivative of x minus 7 to the 1 half, which is 1 half times x minus 7 to the negative 1 half, times 1, that's the derivative of the inside, plus the root of x minus 7 times the derivative of 5x, which is 5. I'm going to put that in front. I'm going to rewrite this here and write it as uh, 5x divided by 2 times the root of x minus 7 plus 5 times the root of x minus 7. Now, I notice that f prime here is undefined at 7. So right away, uh, x equals 7 is a critical point of the function here. And what I need to do now is set this equal to 0 to find more critical points if it has one. All right, so uh, I'm going to probably clear the fractions here and make my life simpler. 
All right, so let's, uh, let's go ahead and multiply by 2 times the root of x minus 7. And what happens is I get 5x um, plus, let me see, 10 times the quantity of x minus 7. Because a root times a root is a root. Excuse me, is, well, x, root of x minus 7 times root of x minus 7 is just x minus 7. And 2 times 5 is 10. And we need to multiply the right side by 0 and by anything, still 0. Distributing through, we get 5x plus 10x minus 7 equals 0. That, of course, is 15x minus or equals 70. <coughs> and then we get 70 divided by 15. And that's 14 thirds after you divide everything by 5. <coughs> so we have critical points. Uh, we have two of them. We have one here. That's another one, 14 thirds. Um, right here. So we have two critical points of the function. Okay? And this number three here, find the, given the first and second derivative of graph f of x. x here, oops, uh, x here, and this is y here. Let me see this, uh, the first derivative is the parabola, so this is f prime. Second derivative is here. And I notice at these points right here, uh, I, and let me see, f prime here, um, f prime is equal to zero at this point, and here f prime is equal to zero. So re relatively in those same positions here, we got, uh, let's see here, uh, f prime is is uh, positive here and here. On, on those intervals to the left of that critical point and to the right of that critical point here. So, and it's positive, and then down here below it, let me graph this in blue here, this part right here, it's negative. F prime is less than zero here, and then here F prime is positive. So, this critical point of the function right here and this is also a critical point of the function, which are relatively right, um, <laughs> right here and yeah, roughly right about here. These occur. This is where the extreme occur at. Okay. But before I do that, what I want to do is just do a little sign analysis here, just so you can see a little bit better. Okay. Now f prime here. Uh, let me see. This is zero here. Right here, this is the first critical point, we'll call it 1, and uh, this is at 2, critical point number 2. Um, what's happening to the left of them and to the right? And, and so, so anyways, this is positive, it's increasing, it's negative in here, and it's positive in here. Alright, so critical point number 1 represents a max, and critical point number 2 represents a min. Okay, I don't really know what these are, but at these values, we have a min and a max, or excuse me, a max and a min. So at the critical point number one, CP number one, and this is called CP number two, um, I have a relative max. Now, listen to me, I've got to find them inflection points and concavity here. So I know, notice right here, at this, uh, let me see, call this one x1, this one x2, and this one x3. That'd be easier that way. At x2, which is roughly right about here, okay, what, what's what's going on there? Well, f prime of uh, f prime, double prime equal to zero. There, there's an inflection point right there at x2. There's an inflection point. All right, on the left of x2, we have f prime of double prime is negative, so it's concave down, and then it goes to concave up. Okay, that's an inflection point. So at x2 here, it goes concave, uh, whoops, concave down. All right, to concave up. So you have an inflection point at x2. I can use that. So let's see here. Let's suppose I put my critical point or my inflection point right here at IP. All right, at x1, or critical point number one, or x1, either one, um, I have a max. So let's suppose I put my max right here. And the uh, critical point three, I have a min. Let's put, uh, suppose I put it right here in min. So my function has to look like this. And let me plot it in red. It's got to hit the min or the max and then come back down. 
and then change concavity at the inflection point, hit the min right there, and then come back up. All right, so using my concavity, I can graph the function, and also I can plot the max and the min at appropriate locations so that the concavity matches up. All right, and again, solutions here, solutions or the graphs may vary. This is only one of uh, an infinite number of possible f of x's here. Okay. Now, number four, we want to find the absolute extrema. The absolute extrema. Okay, that means I've got to compare. I have to compare f of a, f of b, all right, and f of c, where c stands for critical point, where c equals some critical point uh, in the open interval from A to B. Okay, and that's that's important. This part right here, that's important. So the thing is, I want to find critical points first. So that means I got to differentiate. All right, and I get 2x minus 6. Pretty simple. Solve that, I get x equals 3. Oops, why did I put 0 there? I meant 3. Okay, well notice now that uh, three's inside, three's in here, so that's good. Okay, because the critical points have to be in negative five to five. Got to check that out. So now I got to compare f of negative five, f of three, and then f of <clears throat> positive five, and whatever one's the biggest I take is the max, and whichever one's the smallest I take is the min. Okay, so here we go. f of negative five is twenty-five uh, plus thirty plus four. That's 29 plus 30, 59. 3 would be 9 minus 18 plus 4. 13 minus 18 is a negative 5. And 5 is 25 minus 30 uh, plus 4. Negative 5 plus 4, negative 1. Okay, so I've got a min here. I've got a max here. Okay, at x equals negative 5. And then I've got a minimum at x equals 3. Okay, so I got a max here and I got a minimum here. Okay, so moving on, uh, I got to determine where the mean value theorem can be applied, and if so, I got to find C satisfying the mean value theorem. Okay, now mean value theorem has to be differentiable on the open and uh, continuous on the closed. Okay, and this uh, my function here. Uh, x divided by 4 minus x is undefined okay at 4 at x equals 4 okay now since the discontinuity okay uh, at x equals 4 lies outside zero comma three f of x is continuous okay and uh, oops differentiable on zero comma three okay so that tells me right there that uh, mean value theorem applies and that's a good thing because if it does, we've got to find C. All right, we've got to find it such that the f of x equals f of b minus f of a divided by b minus a. Okay, this is the slope of tangent line. And this is the slope of the secant line, if you recall. Okay, we got to find C in a comma b so that the slope of the tangent line equals slope of secant line. Okay, so I calculate the derivative, calculate the slope of secant line, set them equal, and solve that equation. The three-step process. Okay, keeping in mind our function here is x divided by four minus x. So let me just put it over here so I can see it. Okay, so first of all, the derivative, first step, step number one, using the quotient rule, I've got four minus x. 
times 1 minus x times the root of 4 minus x, which is negative 1, all divided by 4 minus x squared. And that's going to be 4 minus x plus x, and that's going to be 4 divided by 4 minus x quantity squared, and there's my derivative. Now step 2, find the slope of the, t, uh, the secant line. So on the interval from 0 to 3, Okay, that's A and that's B. So F of B is th uh, F of 3 minus F of 0, all divided by 3 minus 0. So I substitute 3 in the function, I get 3 divided by 4 minus 3, which is uh, 3 divided by 1 or 3. Substitute 0, you get 0. And then 3 minus 0 is just 3. All right, and 3 divided by 3 is 1. So again, the slope of my secant line is 1. So now, I set these equal. Okay, so my step three is I take four minus, excuse me, four divided by four minus x quantity squared equal to one, and I got to solve this equation. Okay, let's multiply by the denominator, and I get four. Oops, that was a mistake. I get four equals. Uh, 4 minus x quantity squared. I have to square root both sides. And I get plus or minus 2 equals 4 minus x. And I have two equations there that I've got to solve. Well, actually, let me just go ahead and solve this right now. I get minus 4 here. And I get minus 4 plus or minus 2 equals negative x. And negative 4 minus 2 equals negative 6. Okay, negative 4 plus 2 is negative 2, and that's equal to negative x here. Change the sign of both, I get 6 and 2 for my values. Alright, now, which one of these um, is in the interval from uh, 0 to 3? Well, certainly not 6. Okay, so c equals 2 in uh, the interval from 0 to 3. All right, so I found my value, and now what do I have to do? Uh, let's read the directions here. Find the equation of the tangent line at C. Okay, so since we found the value of C, now we got to find it. Okay, so now i got to find the equation of the tangent line. Okay, at C equals 3 or C equals uh, 2. Alright, well I need a point there, so I need to find F of 2. So F of 2 is 2 divided by 4 minus 2, and that's 1, right there. And now, uh, 2 comma 1 is my point of tangency. Okay, so now, what do I have? Well, now it's easy. Y minus Y1 equals M times X minus X1. My slope of the tangent line is right here. That's my slope from previously. Okay, the slope of the secant line equals the slope of the tangent line. So this is a slope right here, or this is slope right here, and the slope of the secant line and the slope of the tangent line are equal. So I just take one and put it here. This is my x1 here, and this is my y1 here. So I just go for it. Y minus one equals one times x minus two. And I solve for y. y equals x minus 2 plus 1. I get y equals x minus 1, which is my tangent line. All right. And at that point, you're pretty happy. All right. This is a video, so go ahead and rewind it and, uh, if you need to. Okay, so, oops, this shouldn't be there. Okay. Let f be differentiable on a, b, and continuous on the closed interval from a to b. If f of a equals f of b, not equal to zero, okay, I erase that. It doesn't have to be equal to zero. Then all they have to do is be equal. Then there exists at least one point, okay, at least one, which means one or more, one or more c values, all right, inside the open interval from a to b, such that f prime is equal to zero. Got a horizontal tangent line there. Okay, so I got to, I got to test 
this right here and this right here. So I got, oops, we should probably change the color of that. <clears throat> I got to test two things. F has to be differentiable in the open and continuous in the closed. And F of A must be a, equal to F of B for Rolle's theorem to apply. So I got to check both. Well, let me, let me see. I got a quadratic or a polynomial. Okay. So polynomials, okay, are continuous, okay, and differentiable everywhere. Okay, so that's good. Now I got to check f of a, or in this case, uh, a is negative four and b is one. So f of negative four, does that equal uh, f of one? I don't know. I got to check it out. So sixteen, got to substitute this in here, right? Uh, sixteen uh, minus twelve minus four, well, that's zero. F of uh, one is 1 plus 3 minus 4, that's 0. Okay, that tells me that f of negative 4 equals f of 1. And so the second part of mean value theorem is satisfied. So this tells me that, excuse me, not mean value theorem, Rolle's theorem. So together, this tells me that Rolle's theorem, okay, can be applied. All right, so now what we do is we find f prime of c equals 0. All right, right here, and we solve for C inside the open interval. Okay, it has to be inside here, and our interval is negative 4 to 1. Okay, so we differentiate. So F prime is equal to 2X plus 3. Whoa, this is pretty difficult. So 2X equals negative 3. X equals negative 3 halves, which is negative 1 and a half. Okay, and it's inside the interval. Uh, from negative 4 to 1. So that's good. C's in the, in the open interval. Okay? And we're good to go. Okay, number 7. We have to identify the open intervals where it's increasing or decreasing. Okay, and you have to check the first derivative again. So, you get 3x squared minus 6x we have to set equal to zero to find critical points. Okay, and factor out a 3x. Okay, and x could be equal to zero or two. And these are critical points of the function. So where is it positive or negative, or where is it increasing and decreasing? Well, that's pretty simple to test. You test critical points, zero and two, and the points in between them from negative infinity to zero, from zero to two, and from two to infinity. So f prime of, let's say, negative 1 is, uh, now again, I'm going to be looking right here because it's easier. f prime is equal to uh, 3x times the quantity of x minus 2. Use that. It's easier to test. And then we get, uh, let me see, a negative times, let's see, 3 times 1, negative 1 is negative. Negative 1 minus 2 is negative. So a negative times a negative is positive. Oops. Equals positive. So I put a positive here, and that means it's increasing. Okay? Now f prime of 1. Okay, 3 times 1 is positive. 1 minus 2 is negative. That's negative, because a positive times a negative is negative. It's negative here, it's decreasing. And then f prime of, let's say, 3. Well, let me see, 3 times 3 is 9, that's positive. 3 minus 2 is positive. Positive times positive is positive. It's increasing there. Okay, so my summary is the following. Open intervals. Is that um, it's increasing on negative infinity to zero and two to infinity. Decreasing on zero to two. There you go. Now, if it's increasing and then decreasing to the left around zero, this becomes a max. And then if it's decreasing and increasing, you have to have a min. So relative is stream, well, that's just min and max. So max at zero comma something, minimum at two comma something. And how do you find the y values? Well, you just substitute it back into the function right here. You've got to use this function here. 
So f of uh, 0 equals 0 uh, plus 3, 3. And then f of uh, 2 is equal to uh, 8 minus 3 times 9, 27 plus 3. 11 minus 27, negative 16. Okay. Okay, and there is the relative extrema, and you're good to go. Now all you have to do is figure out where it's concave up or down. Okay, next what we want to do is find the open intervals uh, where the function is concave up, concave down. Okay, so I need to take uh, second derivative, uh, oops, second derivative, and set it equal to zero to find uh, the critical points of the second derivative. Okay, and so let's do that. Let's go up to the top and get a, uh, the first derivative. Okay, it's right here, 3x squared minus 6x. So f double prime must be 6x minus 6. Alright, which is not too bad. That's not too hard to figure out. So it's 6x minus 6. Let's write that down down here. So at the second derivative must be 6x minus 6, set that equal to 0, obviously x equals 1. So what I want to do is just figure out, whoops, why don't I write 0? Um, see what's happening to the second derivative, uh, left and right of 1. So the second derivative evaluated at 0, let's say, you know, some number to the left of 1, substitute 0 in there, you get negative 6, obviously that's less than 0, it's negative, that means it's concave down from negative infinity to 1. So, uh, concave down on negative infinity to 1. F double prime of, let's say, 2. At 6 times 2, minus 6. Uh, don't need that symbol there. And it's right here. What's going on here? There we go. That's better. Okay, and that's obviously uh, 12 minus 6 is 6. That's greater than 0. It's positive. Concave up. Okay, on 1 to infinity. Alright? Very, very simple. Okay, next what we want to do is figure out the horizontal asymptotes. And whenever you figure those out, uh, you take a limit as x approaches positive or negative infinity of the function, and it better be equal to a real number here, all right, out where, where L is a real number. This one involves a trig function, so let's use the squeeze theorem and see if we can bound it. We know uh, that cosine is bounded, okay, between negative 1 and 1. So let me bound cosine x first. Let's multiply everything by 8. That doesn't affect the inequalities at all. Now, x squared plus 1 is always positive, so when I divide by x squared plus 1, nothing changes. And now I want to take the limits as x approaches infinity uh, of all three uh, parts there of the inequality to see what happens. So what I want to do is bound this thing by two known limits that are the same. Okay, and let's see what we get here when we take the limit. Notice the numerator is constant and the denominator is not. It's getting infinitely large, which means the fraction is getting infinitely small. So this one's going to zero here, and so is this one. And notice that the limit in the interior here is bounded between two zeros. So if you just use a little bit of common sense here, the limit in the middle better be zero by the, by the squeeze principle or the pinching theorem. Okay, if you're in between two zeros, you have to be zero. Almost a common uh, sense principle, and it's intuitive, and this is the case. So uh, that limit is also zero by the squeeze principle. Okay, now let's on, see on number 9. Uh, see if we have any oblique asymptotes. Okay, the degree of the numerator is 2. So this is degree equals 2. 
This is degree equals 1. Okay, they differ by 1. So they differ uh, by exactly 1, and that's good. Exactly 1. That means we have a horizontal as or excuse me, oblique asymptote. And how do we do it? Well, we do it by long division. Okay, so we're going to take 8x squared minus 5x. We're going to divide it by x plus 1. We're going to take the first term divided by the first term. So 8x squared divided by x is 8x. Multiply x plus 1 by 8x. You get 8x squared plus 8x. We're going to subtract here and get a result. 8x squared minus 8x squared is 0. Negative 5x minus 8x is a negative 13x. Now I want to divide negative 13x by x and get a minus 13. Then multiply negative 13x uh, minus 13. And then subtract. And I get remainder 13. So plus 13 divided by x plus 1. So my linear portion here is your oblique asymptote. So oblique, oblique asymptote is y equals 8x minus 13. All right, let's go ahead and digest that a little bit and uh, see if you agree. But that's that's what I get. Okay, now we're going to find some limits here of the function here. I noticed that. Uh, when we take a limit of the function as x goes to infinity, I just look at degrees. Degree in the numerator is less than the degree in the denominator. So this increases faster. Increases faster here. Oops, faster. Alright, so this limit's going to be 0. Why? Well, divide everything by x squared. So, so the limit as x goes to infinity uh, of f of x is found by taking every single term and divided by x squared. So 5x squared divided by x squared, excuse me, 5x divided by x squared is 5 divided by x minus 8 divided by x squared, divided by 3 minus 7 divided by x squared. All the fractions are going to have limits of 0, including this one. So I get 0 minus 0 divided by 3 minus 0, and we get 0 here. Okay. Now notice on the next one here, when I substitute 1 in, all right, 1 here, I get 0 here and I get 0 here. All right, and 0 divided by 0 is indeterminate. Okay, no good. But it says, that tells me that uh, La Hapital's rule applies. Okay. All right, so what I want to do so I'm going to take a derivative of the numerator and denominator and evaluate the limit. All right, so I'm going to take the limit as x approaches 1 as the derivative of the numerator using the chain rule. So the derivative of cosine or sine is cosine times the derivative of the inside, which is pi. So I get pi times cosine of pi x divided by 1. Directly substitute a 1 in here, and I get pi times the cosine a pi, which is pi times negative 1, or simply pi. So you're going to have to use La Hapital's rule a little bit. Okay, and then you're going to have to do some related rate problems too. There's always some given information here, and there's always something that you're going to have to find. There's always an equation that applies. Okay, so you want to figure out each of these first before you even begin to differentiate the equation in respect to time. So air is being pumped into a spherical balloon. Sphere is important. Um, suppose the volume of the balloon is increasing. Volume is increasing as a positive number at a rate of 400 centime cubic centimeters per second. This right here is dv to t, okay, the change in volume over time. So that's given to me. The volume or change in volume over time is positive 400 cubic, cubic centimeters per second. The volume, so it's cubic centimeters per second uh, when the radius is exactly 30, 30 uh, centimeters. How fast is the radius, that's dr dt, uh, increasing at that time when r is exactly 30? So when r is exactly 30 centimeters, what in the world is that? 
that's what you want to find. So dr to t when r is 30, this is an r, centimeters, you know, what is that? Okay, now since we're dealing with a sphere here, that tells me the equation we're working on. And air is a volume. Okay, it's volume. So we need the volume of a sphere. Okay, so the volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed. And so what we want to do is differentiate this, differentiate in respect to time. Because we want to figure out how fast things are changing as they are related to something else that's changing. So you take the derivative of volume in respect to time, that's the dv dt. Differentiate 4 thirds pi r cubed in respect to time. We get 4 thirds pi times 3r squared times the derivative of r in respect to time. Well, that's dr dt. Okay. Now I know that dv dt is 400. That's equal to, and these threes cancel out, and it's going to be equal to 4 pi times dr dt, which is what we're trying to find. Oops, 4 pi uh, r squared in here, sorry. So what I want to do is evaluate this uh, function when r equals 30 centimeters. So I'm going to substitute that in right there. Okay, so I get 400 is equal to 4 pi times 30 squared, basically. All right, dr dt. All right, let me uh, simplify this a little bit here. Let me change that. Okay, 30 squared is 900, so I'm going to divide by 900 pi. So I get uh, 100 divided by 900, oops, 900 pi equals dr dt. Simplify a little bit. 1 divided by 9 pi equals dr dt. And then it's a change in radius over time. And since the units of volume is in uh, centimeters and the radius is in centimeters, this is centimeters per second. All right. And that's it right there. Okay. So you're going to have to play with related rates a little bit. And, um, be able to handle some simple problems. Okay, let's draw a picture of this situation here. We got a ladder leaning against a vertical wall. Okay, walls are typically vertical. At least I hope so, because if they're not, my house is not going to stay up for very long. All right, now it's leaning against the wall. So let's draw a ladder leaning against the wall here. Boom, right there. There's a ladder. All right, it's 10 foot long. So 10 feet here. It's a ladder. It's leaning against the vertical wall. The foot of the ladder is being pulled away from the wall at a constant rate of 2 feet per second. So it's moving here. Let's call this x here and this is y. Uh, at dx, dt, the change in uh, distance here is changing at 2 feet per second. That's how I interpret that. Alright, when the ladder is exactly 8 feet from the wall, when the ladder is exactly 8 feet from the wall, that means when x is equal to exactly 8 feet, how fast is the top of the ladder changing? How fast? Well, that's dy dt, all right, when uh, x is exactly 8 feet. You know, what is that? Okay, and that's what we have to find. Okay, so what I need to do is come up with the equation that works with right triangles. And guys, this is a right triangle, okay? Look at that. Right triangle and Pythagorean theorem always works. All right. So when you work on these problems, any time you see a uh, right triangle here, kick in everything you know about right triangles, like Pythagorean theorem, right triangle trick, basic stuff. Okay. I know that x squared plus y squared is equal to 10 feet squared, or 100. By differentiating respect to time. Oops, get back here. In respect to time, I get 2x times dx dt plus 2y times dy dt 
equals 0. Alright, I'm going to divide everything by 2, cancel out the 2's. Alright, and start substituting information in. Alright, um, I know x, uh, I, want to, I want to find, oops, oops, that's, oops, sorry about that. Come on, Jeff. Oh, that's me, Mr. Ainsworth. Okay, I want to find the uh, dy dt when x is exactly 8. Now, when this is 8, uh, y squared plus 8 squared is equal to 10 squared. When you solve for this, you get y equals 6. So when x is exactly 8, y is 6. So substituting some values in here, I get 8 times dx dt, 2, plus y, 6, times dy dt, which is what our unknown is in this situation, equals 0. And this is 16, of course. So I get 6 times dy dt, k equals negative 16, divided by 6. I get dy dt is equal to negative 16, 6. What's that equal to? Negative 8 thirds. Um, feet per second. And that, my friends, is what we're trying to find. Change in vertical distance as the, wa uh, the bottom of the ladder is falling or moving to the right at 2 feet per second. Okay? Alright. We'll give this the best shot here. Combine this with all the other review materials that I gave you in the past week. Practice by doing, by picking up that pencil and putting it in paper and Repeat these examples as many times as it takes to master them. All right, give it your best shot. Put in your time. It'll pay off. See you tomorrow.